Warning, this video contains spoilers for She-Hulk Attorney at Law Season 1's last episode, so if you have not seen the show or the last episode and wish to remain unspoiled, you should skip this video for now and come back to it when you are ready. This will be your only warning. Okay? Okay. Biological Riley presents She-Hulk Attorney at Law Spoilers. She-Hulk Attorney at Law thrives on narrative shorthand. This Marvel Studios show, which is about the super-powered attorney Jennifer Walters as she juggles her career as a lawyer with her nature as a super strong, super green, super muscly, super sapphic fantasy that makes all the lesbian bottoms scream senpai, simplifies complicated subjects. For one thing, the show streamlines the concept of a lawyer-based procedural. After all, the lineage of cases that Jen battles is clearly meant for television spectacle rather than a realistic portrayal of an actual courtroom. In fact, the show decomplicates otherwise complicated legal procedurals for the express purpose of dramatization. It is a Marvel Cinematic Universe production after all. Ensure the show's courtroom cases have real-world parallels to actual court trials, but She-Hulk is still a fictionalized, easier-to-digest version of court events compared to anything in reality. It's basically a simplistic made-for-TV courtroom, just like Judge Judy, but a version of Judge Judy, who is green, young, has muscles, and has my implicit permission to pile drive me. Because, yes, I'm one of those aforementioned lesbian bottoms. <laughs> I have no idea if I'm going to keep this joke in the video or not. Let's see where this goes. Additionally, She-Hulk's streamlined narrative affected its mental health themes as well. Seeing as this is a Hulk family show, i.e. tangentially related to this superhero who is iconic for having anger management issues, the show broaches the topic of dialectical behavioral therapy, i.e. a subtype of cognitive behavioral therapy that helps mentally ill folks process feelings, emotions, and life events in healthy and productive ways. The core tenets of dialectical behavioral therapy, or DB rather, is that two polarly opposing facts and ideas can be true at the same time. Like you can have a favorite band and still acknowledge that some of their members are problematic. You can be angry with someone, but still care for them. And you can love your old geezer dog, but hate them when they take forever to take a shit when we're at sub-zero temperatures outside. Come on, you dog. Take that doggy dump. And with She-Hulk, the show incorporates this idea that two polarly opposing things can be true at the same time into its plot. It's actually part of the narrative, yet it is worth noting that She-Hulk's portrayal of DBT is incomplete, because honestly, there are other tenets to it as well, such as deep meditative introspection, being mindful of the senses, learning to be more assertive, and distress tolerance, i.e. learning how to tolerate distress, obviously, which is something that is very important for a Hulk to learn how to do because obviously Bruce Banner losing his temper endangers everyone because, you know, he turns into the Hulk. You just can't get upset about little trivial things like how much Wrigley Field overcharges for their overpriced beer piss, even though those prices should be criminal. But I digress distress tolerance. And in regards to all these different aspects and nuances of DBT, She-Hulk Attorney at Law either glosses over or downright ignores all these little facets of the therapy. They are more or less omitted from the show's representation of DBT in order to make the complicated definition easier to digest for audiences. It's basically cinematic Pepto-Bismol, and admittedly She-Hulk's simplistic narrative is fine. Whether we are discussing the show's representation of courtroom decorum or DBT, this is still a light-hearted affair. It's a silly comic book Hulk show after all. So brevity and the Diet Coke version of these complicated subjects is in order. The show's streamlined nature just makes sense here. But unfortunately, there are other places where She-Hulk's narrative shorthand does not stick the landing as well. Other areas which harms the program's overall quality, by which I mean the ending. See, She-Hulk Attorney at Law's conclusion had its own storytelling shortcuts as well. Shortcuts that actually undermine the show's overall narrative momentum that led up to it. And to explain this, allow me to explain this. Prior to the penultimate episode, Jen was at her lowest moment. In fact, she was downright betrayed. She was backstabbed by a potential romantic interest who was actually only pretending to like her so that he could draw some of her magic Hulk blood and gift it back to a network of misogynistic and bigoted online trolls who all hate She-Hulk, hitting her for really silly reasons like how she's a girl version of the Hulk and criticize her for being a Mary Sue, which, subtle. And this all comes to a head when those aforementioned online trolls 
trolls do a bit of revenge porn against Jen in a public setting, causing her to hulk out and smash property, frightening both civilians and the US taxpayer aplenty, and further proving that She-Hulk should have learned more about DBT than just Banner's more threadbare explanation, because some distressed tolerance probably would have helped here. But regardless, this drama leads into the final episode. Jen, who lost her job, was bailed out of prison, had to move back in with her parents, and was ordered by the court to never transform into She-Hulk again, eventually stumbles onto a gathering of those aforementioned online trolls who targeted her, where she makes some unfortunate discoveries. For one thing, Emil Blonsky, i.e. the Abomination, i.e. Jen's client who had otherwise turned a corner, was present at the meeting and doing a speaking gig in his Abomination form, which violated his own court order. The leader of the online troll group, who is revealed to be the creep Todd, injects himself with She-Hulk's Hulk blood and turns into a green monster himself, and Mark Ruffalo's Hulk comes in to fight Todd in the Abomination, all while Jen legally cannot transform into her super strong persona due to how she would be placed in prison. It's all kind of a lot and kind of a mess, and all these things combined causes Jen to have an existential crisis. After all, the bad guys essentially won, and her own sense of importance is being minimized in her own story. Like the internet trolls got the upper hand, her support of Blomsky was in vain, and the Hulk is swooping in to save the day as if Jennifer Walters is incapable of saving herself, which ultimately undermines what Jen wishes for the narrative. It nullifies Jen's we can do it feminist ideals. The show, however, is aware of this. In fact, this existential crisis motivates Jen to break the fourth wall, something that she has done throughout the whole season, yet not to such an extensive degree. See, for the whole season, Jen has been aware that she has been in a TV show. In fact, throughout the season, she directly addressed the audience numerous times, often to positive comedic effect. But the finale takes this to a whole new level, a whole new level of confidence, of power, of Pantera references, because I'm full of those. In the back half of the last episode, the third act of the third act, if you will, Jen leaves Marvel Studios She-Hulk and enters Marvel Studios Marvel Studios, or at least a fictionalized version therein. Once there, she breaks past various levels of security and confronts the Marvel Cinematic Universe's mastermind named Kevin. No, not Kevin Feige, but a fictionalized version of Kevin who is actually an advanced AI who develops all the stories within the MCU continuity. And from there, Jen lays out all the criticisms of her storyline, the one where she loses agency in her own narrative and ultimately convinces Kevin to make some changes. She more or less has Kevin change her ending. And with the rewrite, or the re-edit rather, Jen is no longer bounded by law to not transform into She-Hulk. The leader of the online trolls is arrested. Emil is also arrested, but is still very likable and understandable. Bruce Banner is scratched from the climactic confrontation. And Matt Murdock, i.e. Daredevil, is added into the fray. Mostly because Jen desires for her and Matt to create some steamy Catholic guilt. Because yes, they Fuck, how about that for a climax? Oh, I'm a child. Admittedly, She-Hulk Attorney at Law's conclusion has a lot of creative merit, mostly because it has themes of female self-determinism. See, throughout the season, Jen stresses that She-Hulk Attorney at Law is a lawyer show, meaning that it's a legal drama more so than a superhero one. It's what she wants her life to be, more so than just being yet another Marvel Cinematic Universe superhero adventure. Yet Kevin, the fictional mastermind behind this show, regularly undermines Jen's desires here. If anything, the usual superhero tropes more or less invade Jen's show, especially towards the end, all to the point that Kevin's vision for She-Hulk as a show conflicts with Jen's own sense of self-determinism and just overall devalues her in her own story, like Jen loses control of her life and narrative, and not just to Kevin, but to the internet trolls who deride her as a Mary Sue and someone undeserving of a Hulk's powers, i.e a man's powers. If anything, the narrative as originally written by Kevin has these misogynistic shit weasels dominate Jen's life and all the conversations surrounding her, which ultimately socially confines Jen and restricts her actions and autonomy, which is very relatable for women trying to exist in a public sphere. Like for example, let's take any modern actress who is cast in a modern MCU project, especially if they are an actress of color, and you'll find a lot of pissing and moaning from supposed fans who make misogyny, racism, and transphobia palatable to the masses and have figured out a way to transform these grievances where they will be upset about basically anything that hints at having feminist, anti-racist, or LGBTQ affirming storylines into a lucrative venture where they bitch and moan in perpetuity and label everything they don't enjoy as quote unquote woke so that they don't have to explain why their said criticisms are based in misogyny, racism, and homophobia. Because the grift economy has got a grift and truly be some of the most miserable types of creators on YouTube. May the 
content last forever. God, that sounds like a threat more and more these days. And when it comes to the MCU and its more recent casting or events, you will find content with criticisms that dominate social media sites like YouTube, Twitter, or etc. see the explosion of misogynistic bullshit back in 2019 with Captain Marvel and its star Brie Larson. And hell, we can even see this with social media's coverage of She-Hulk Attorney at Law, because some very strong men who are very insecure in their masculinity felt very threatened by She-Hulk's twerking glutes. And awesomely enough, She-Hulk Attorney at Law is more than aware of these internet sad boys who try to dominate the online discourse surrounding MCU characters and actresses. The show is aware that these types of content creators try to define the conversations surrounding nerd culture properties as well as gatekeep others, that they post downright malicious content that thrives on denigrating women, people of color, and queer folks, which is honestly something that perfectly describes She-Hulk's main antagonist, Todd, who runs a network of chuds and doesn't believe that She-Hulk deserves her powers, i.e. they think she's a Sue. and instead finds that he, and by extension the online shuttle Wumpai, are more deserving of She-Hulk's powers, that they should be the ultimate arbiters of who deserves superpowers and who deserves to be a superhero within the MCU, which ultimately reflects the shit show that is the misogynistic online discourse within the real-life gatekeepy fandom of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And in terms of how art embodies reality here, Todd and his chuds represent how online tools attempt to dominate the conversation surrounding shows and characters like She-Hulk, that they try to minimize a character's and an actress's own agency, thus embodying She-Hulk Attorney at Law's very self-aware meta-commentary surrounding the shit show of online discourse that accompanies the also predictable backlash to Marvel's desire to have a more diverse and female-led lineup of superheroes. An online discourse that, similar to Kevin's original ending to She-Hulk, was a mess tied with misogynistic bullshit that is toxic towards the diverse talent that represents a lot of modern MCU shows and movies, a mess that undermines the desires of women, folks of color, and queer folks on these projects, up to and including the leads of these movies and TV shows. This is ultimately why Jen broke the fourth wall and spoke to Kevin. After all, she views the conclusion to her own show as it stands as to be a mess and one that devalues her own uniquity and her own desires, her hopes for her career, her aims to have She-Hulk Attorney at Law to be a lawyer show, and thus she confronts Kevin, not through violence, but through a well-reasoned and very meta argument. She presents her case, so to speak, that this is her story and not meant to be minimized by overt misogynistic pricks like the online trolls or even anti-feminist tropes like the idea that she needed Mark Ruffalo's Hulk to save the day, instead opting to have Todd be sent to prison and to swap out Mark Ruffalo's Hulk for a man that she actually wants at her ending that she has a sexual desire for, because ultimately she will turn at law is Jen's show and she can run it however she wants, which means going to Pound Town with Matt Murdoch, though let's hope that she doesn't physically break him, because one wrong move and that cock's gonna snap like a twig, but then again, that's all part of the thrill. She-Hulk Attorney at Law's ending is good in concept. As far as thematic storytelling goes, the idea of having a finale be about a woman's personal agency and telling online chuds to get fucked is always a positive by my reckoning. It feels good. But unfortunately, there is an issue here. See, the feminist themes may be a good sentiment and a relevant idea in today's media-consuming environment, but the execution of those said themes don't exactly work or create a satisfying narrative conclusion in She-Hulk Attorney at Law, mostly because like the lawyer in DBT examples earlier in this essay, it's a form of narrative shorthand, though this time it streamlines the narrative itself rather than an occupational field or a complex behavioral therapy. And unfortunately, unlike those examples, the shorthand doesn't necessarily work this time, because Jen and Kevin essentially hand wave away all the rising tension and the buildup that the show fermented in its first eight and a half episodes by more or less rewriting the story, which on the one hand makes sense thematically, but doesn't necessarily equate into a satisfying finale when it comes to following on-screen action and events. Like, I would have preferred to see Jen wiggle her way out of that bad situation, the one that, as stated before, built up over eight and a half episodes in narrative, rather than just have her deflate all that storytelling momentum via an argument with the fictionalized creator of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Which, once again, the argument fits into the show's themes and Jen's character development, but is also unfortunately not as interesting to watch visually. Like, hand-waving away a whole season's worth of development isn't the best way to conclude that 
that said season. And while sure the show's overarching narrative isn't the most engrossing, hell, Jen points out to Kevin that using magic blood as a plot device and having third acts heavy on action spectacle are old, long-standing, and predictable tropes within the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but these are tropes for a reason. They are elements that support what the MCU does best, which is the development of its lead characters. And that was true for She-Hulk Attorney at Law as well. It is a very silly show that used standardized MCU-isms in order to craft a fun narrative with a strong lead. And with that, I just wish the whole season's worth of rising action had a satisfying conclusion that befitted all the narrative development up to that point. That in this case, it didn't use narrative shorthand to magically give She-Hulk the finale she desired. It really should have just happened in action, and not just as a form of meta-commentary that wraps a nice bow around everything, rather than giving us a really fulfilling conclusion. Hell, it could have done both. Like, Jen could have still had an argument with Kevin and change her ending, all while having that said conclusion be satisfying to watch. Like, she could have changed her ending to where she transported herself back to taking on Tan. She still could have removed Bruce Banner's Hulk from the equation. Emil Blonsky, i.e. the Abomination, could eventually assist Jen when it finally clicks that he was speaking to a group that were actively hurting his friend, which would have been a good redemption for him. The Hulk blood could have eventually proved toxic to Todd and petered out, showcasing that he was in fact not worthy of She-Hulk's powers. After the fact, the authorities could have stricken She-Hulk's discretions from her record. After all, they did not punish the Incredible Hulk to such a degree, even after decades of him hulking out, destroying property, and frightening suburban housewives. So maybe Jen could be treated with the same respect. And Daredevil could still arrive late after Jen already took care of business. And with all of these things, the narrative still could have easily had the best of both worlds here. It still could have had its clever meta-commentary about a woman's autonomy, all while delivering a conclusion that was visually satisfying to watch. There was just another option here. Admittedly, She-Hulk Attorney at Law is still a good show. Its lead character is fun, and the show's lighter tone and silliness has a certain infectious charm to it. And due to this, it's overall able to withstand some of the hiccups of its inconsistent concluding episode. Because ultimately, She-Hulk Attorney at Law is still an enjoyable show, and even though its ending deserved to play out in story, it is not enough to derail the season's bevy of positive qualities. Maybe next time, if there's a season two, which I honestly hope there is, they don't use narrative shorthand on the narrative itself. Maybe let all of that rising action ultimately play out in the story's conclusion. Just a thought. And with that, that was the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please leave a like rating, share, subscribe, ring the bell, and leave a comment telling me what you thought of She-Hulk Attorney at Law's ending. Also, please consider checking out my Patreon page. One dollar a month gets you onto this credit sequence, and five dollars a month allows you to start making review requests. The link to my Patreon is in the description. And speaking of Patreon, I just want to thank my patrons, particularly my high tier ones and David, Samantha, Devlin, Mom, and Morgan. Thank you so much for supporting what I do. Love y'all.